First watch of Minecraft, but I survive in parkour civilization. We must destroy the upper class. I did not expect this to be a retelling of 1984 and also the New Testament. And anybody who says stuff like that, I promise is only partly joking. I including the apotheosis and the second coming. <laughs> Last night, I unironically spent four hours straight watching the entire duology of the Minecraft, but I survive in parkour civilization films. Produced, directed, written, and edited by visionary director and Scorsese caliber filmmaker Eve Bow. Gaze upon his glory visage. That heartwarming smile could brighten anybody's day and uplift even the most troubled of individuals into hoping for a better tomorrow. It is through his journey from the bottom of parkour society to the top that he teaches us the most important lessons about life and ourselves that we possibly could ever learn. I am only 40% joking? I'm not sure exactly, but it's less than half. Hi again, guys, and I am a truther. Not of Obama being born in Kenya, because that would make me stupid, but of parkour civilization being absolute peak fiction. An opinion that makes me really smart and correct actually. I'm being so serious when I say to watch that series before this video. I'm sure a lot of you already have, it's kind of inescapable right now, but that's because I'm doing full spoilers for the plot here. I need you to understand the level of evangelist I have become for this little thing. I'm being real genuine here, that end card of the video isn't even going to be showing one of my own videos. It's me telling you instead to watch Minecraft But I Survive and Parkour Civilization full movie. Because knowing some of you, you're not going to believe that it's worth the full four hour commitment to binge both things unless I've spoiled the plot and saying its unironic praises ahead of time. And like, come on, man, who even cares what percentage of y'all are subscribed to my channel with notifications on? Statistically, more of you aren't subscribed to Evebo. That's a far greater crime, so go suck on his toes instead. Now, the Parkour Civilization movies are actually supercuts of the original standalone series, which were a bunch of individual episodes, and these movies are all the episodes in one season just squished together in one big supercut, and each one ended up at like two hours feature length. So if you hear me switching between the terms like movie, series, and episodes, that would be why. The unironic fandom that has popped off from the series getting passed around on Twitter like a twink at a frat house has been nothing short of insane. This might be my greatest post ever. Hardcore civilization has become a very powerful brain-eating virus in my head during the course of today. Man, I'm so hungry. <laughs> How hungry. You won't get this if you don't have context. Again, watch the videos. So many in-jokes are only going to make sense if I explain them to you where you get off your ass and do what I've been telling you to. You know the deal. You can do the one block jump for the raw chicken, or you can attempt the one block vertical jump for the beef. Here in Parkour Civilization, no one chooses to jump for the beef. It's better to be safe and do the one block jump for the chicken rather than risk your entire life for just half a hunger bar more. You're gonna make fun of me for the level of investment I have in this if you haven't already been indoctrinated, and I feel bad for you if you aren't. The propaganda arm for this series is unmatched except perhaps for the most nefarious strategists in the depths of a Republican super PAC, and I'm at the point where I need to sigh op saddest into binging this thing so I can see their genius chandled into something about Okay, so basically, in parkour civilization, every facet of society is based around parkour. Go figure. Your ability to do parkour is your currency, and harder maneuvers are worth more money. Basically, if you do a harder jump, then you can buy a bigger house, per se. You can bribe people with a sick enough parkour combo by doing sick, nasty tricks in front of them and more shit like that. Your station in life is determined by how good at parkour you are, with parkour noobs at the bottom of the hierarchy. These proles are without the ability to even sprint because they are perpetually kept at a low hunger, below three hunger bars. They scrap through each day with the eventual hope of being able to win a ticket in a parkour ticket challenge. This ticket is a pass that allows you to make the trek up the parkour temple so that you can attempt your hand at shedding the chains of parkour noob and rise to the rank of parkour pro. Those guys are a cut above the news and have a good life on that second layer. The thing is, at the start of the series, it's told to us that ascending to a parkour pro is a feat that supposedly no noob has ever managed to achieve. But even despite that, people people fight for just the chance to accomplish it all the same. The thing is, you are the lowest of the low at the noob level, but you can go lower technically. Nobody really knows what happens when you fall into the void by missing a jump until you do it yourself. And when our protagonist Eve Bo does fall into the void after securing a ticket to attempt the parkour temple challenge, he fails the first jump and finds that there is something even deeper than the purgatory he calls home. A special kind of hell that only the inhabitants of parkour civilization can truly appreciate the horror of. Parkour prison. <laughs> There is no safe ground down here. You have to make one block jumps to get anywhere, and your cell is where you are confined to forever. You have to jump every 30 seconds, otherwise you get in trouble with the parkour pros. And whenever you're down there, you're sentenced to 50 years in that confinement, with the only way to reduce your sentence being to do parkour challenges for the amusement of
of the parkour wardens. These same pros force imprisoned noobs to be guinea pigs that they test their newest parkour courses on. There is one other way out other than just serving your whole sentence, where you can get your jail time commuted and return to the surface, but under one stipulation. You have to give up the right to ever take on the parkour temple challenge again, and you will never be allowed to ascend to the status of parkour pro. The alternative here is serving your full 50 year prison sentence, where if you miss a single jump, you will die for real. There's nothing below that, buddy, sorry. <laughs> Something funny to me is that Evebo has a pretty in character delivery for almost the whole series, just very consistent, but he has a uniquely visceral reaction when he sees one specific person die multiple times. It's like he becomes the epitome of gamers becoming S tier voice actors while they die in a video game. My neighborhood, pretty much everyone has fallen into the void and died, except for the guy who lives right next to me. He's been my neighbor for five years. No! No way, it is my neighbor. Wow, I'm so glad I'm not alone down here. I just- No! Dude! Now, Evebo ultimately took the deal of being released on the stipulation that he could never be a Minecraft pro, and he had to move into a new house after his old one got foreclosed on post his arrest. But much like I do inside your home, our hero found an old man living in a secret room in the walls of his new house. This old man tells him he can give Evebo a second chance at being a pro, even though he's technically lost the privilege to try. It takes Evebo tons of preparation and a grueling journey, but he eventually succeeds. He goes where the old man told him to, and instead of finding a ticket, he finds an illegal MacGuffin, a barrier block he's technically not supposed to be allowed to have. He busts belongs his way back to the old man, only to find out that said old person jumped into the void of his own free will but he did leave behind a parting gift. A ticket to the parkour temple that he had promised Evebo from the start. This was his chance to redeem himself. Now with new motivation burning in his heart, thinking of all the things people had sacrificed for him to get this chance again, Evebo scaled the parkour temple one more time. It was not an easy path, it never was going to be, but he still found himself on the very cusp of success. But as he finds himself about to take the final jump, Evebo realizes that something isn't right. You see, the final leap in this course is a physically impossible one for a noob to make. It's a three block horizontal gap, and to cross that many blocks, a player needs to be able to sprint. Noobs are kept starved, and they are not able to sprint in this dystopian society. They're never fed enough food to have more than three bars of hunger. From the start, this jump is rigged, and it seemed like all was lost. That was until Evo realized exactly why the old man sent him on such a grueling journey to obtain an illegal barrier block. It's brilliant because we come to this realization of why the jump being impossible is no mistake only a few minutes before Eve does. We get a moment of dramatic irony, where we know more than our protagonist, and for just long enough that we realize everything Evebo thinks he knows about the world will come crashing down soon. This is it. When I walk up these steps, I will be at the top level of parkour civilization. These statues looked like they were showing the parkour noobs and the parkour pros. They even had their boots on. I mean, look at these statue... What the? Gold boots? Who wears gold boots? What is this? Am I not at the top of parkour civilization? Am I not at the top of parkour civilization? Hold up, his writing is this fire? It was all a farce. The parkour pros were never even the top of society. And it's at this point where the stark reality of parkour civilization comes into focus. The noobs are little more than a resource animal and were never intended to be able to ascend the ranks. The pros themselves are similarly constrained by the society to live in. They're not living the good life, they're the working class. They are not the utopia to aspire to, the noobs were led to believe. There was more to parkour civilization than they were ever supposed to know. Above the pros reside the parkour masters, who are the true bourgeoisie of parkour civilization. But even above them, a single parkour champion reigns above all, and he's the one who calls the shots. The sequence of what Ebo just experienced is one of the earliest examples of this series excelling at foreshadowing. Pretty much every little thing you can think of was set up or explained in some way in another scene first. That three block gap was also already used as a reason that a noob could not leave their cell in parkour prison. They don't do this shit by half measures either. Things that happen in the sequel series are payoffs to shit that was teased very directly in the first season. My favorite example of this doesn't really fit here, so I will explain that one later on. Back on track, Evebo becoming the first ever noob to rank up to pro did not go unnoticed. Nobody saw it coming. The first dude that Evebo comes across on the pro level is shocked to see him, not sure where he even came from. That same person immediately gets on the phone with a mystery man that clearly does not want Evebo to become a parkour pro, something already evidenced by the illegal 
barrier block being needed to beat that rigged jump. As we learn more about the trappings of the pro level of parkour civilization, the concept in the extent of parkour being the highest priority in society gets fleshed out even more. Being able to do sick hops is still the only currency, but you can do more things with that when you're a pro. You can order custom-built parkour obstacles to practice in your house where they get delivered right to you. Payment for the construction is doing equivalently hard parkour obstacles for the person installing it. And there is a cultural expectation of tipping in the form of extra hard parkour moves mirroring the tipping culture of the service industry in America today. Pros are expected to do daily labor tasks in exchange for time in the training area, which is the only spot on the pro level where you can practice parkour without fear of dying from a fall, making it incredibly valuable to have access to. All of this training in an effort to hopefully, maybe one day, become a parkour master. A process that, like getting promoted from a noob to a pro, is intended solely as propaganda. It was never meant to be actually achievable. There's no technical requirement that a pro is required to do daily labor, but it's an unspoken rule. One that does not go unpunished when it's broken. You see, one day Evebo decided to take a day off from labor, and his neighbor was shocked by this as he had never seen anyone take a day off. Even though there's technically not anything saying that they can't. The only thing we've been given that could kind of hint to the issue is that parkour masters rarely come down to the pro level, but when they do, it's bad news for the pros. And lo and behold, when Evebo decides to shirk his work, that's when a parkour master decides to come and see what's up. He descends from the heavens, seemingly taking no damage from the fall, and says that he knows someone skipped out on work. The dude inevitably figures out who the slacker is, and he chooses to punish our lonely, lonely Evebo with his superior parkour skills in an introduction to one of the most important concepts in the series, parkour battles. Basically, it's like a Pokemon battle. The second someone challenges you and lays down the first obstacle, you are locked into competing, being the laws of the written universe. Each combatant takes turns attacking with parkour moves, and you must defend against your opponent's attack by successfully repeating the moves that they did. If you pull this off, it is then your turn to attack with your own parkour combo. If you fail to repeat your opponent's move, you will take damage based on the difficulty of the move that you failed. There's more to it, though. Instead of mirroring the move directly, you can try to one-up an opponent's attack by countering with an even harder set of parkour combos. Your opponent will then either have to one-up your attack with their own, or successfully mirror it to defend. I, I know it's a lot, and I repeated a lot of the same words. It's explained better in the series than I'm gonna manage to here. Just know that they introduce you to the mechanics gradually, and build upon them in a well-paced and believable way. The longer the series goes on, the spectacle gets more intense, and the parkour that's being shown off gets harder and harder, keeping you engaged in the increased complexity. All of this while avoiding the potential issue of power creep that's a danger when writing any combat or power system in universe. I, I need y'all to understand the brain worms I've contracted with this. There is a mechanically deep and internally consistent turn-based parkour battle system with an advanced metagame and layers of tech that are played around with both systematically and thematically to create believable twists in the plot and how we understand the format of the combat. There are callbacks to the time that certain moves were first introduced in the earliest episodes of the series, and they have consistent and believable payoffs down the line all throughout, all of which was adapted from actual existing Minecraft parkour, so it's made immediately accessible to those familiar with the game's actual techniques that the series builds its systems on. It also has the secondary positive effect of teaching the less studied like myself about actual shit in the game you might not have known in an engaging narrative format! Watching the series to completion and seeing how it builds upon itself is like playing the Titanfall 2 campaign for the first time, where each level has a unique mechanic that is pushed to its absolute limit and forces you to learn that gimmick inside and out by the time the level is over and it moves on to the next one. After playing Astrobot and watching this series right after, the feeling across these two pieces of media, I, I, I can't describe it, it's so similar. Mark my words, this battle system will be a codified niche in Minecraft game modes if it isn't already. It might be adapting something that was pre-existing before this series, but I didn't experience it anywhere, and how it's communicated here is really well done. If you're into trying to write things with believable magic systems that the inhabitants of your world are all consistently bound to the rules of, then I'm not kidding, you might unironically find something to appreciate in the systems of parkour civilization. <laughs> when people say that the series goes from being scared of one-block jumps and basic moves being deadly, to the final showdown being on the level of spectacle and power scaling of Gogeta versus Broly, they are correct when you take it in the context of the universe. Ibbo early on pulls off a few jumps he did not think he was capable of on the first try. These signature jumps impress people and are seen as difficult or even unheard of. There's a 360 jump that he does and a backwards jump. These are moves that impress people so much that they try it themselves and end up getting themselves killed because of how difficult it is. It shows us that one way or another, Eve Bo is special. Yeah, it's a shonen, all right? It's one of those same moves that gets introduced early on that later lets Eve Bo overcome his first ever parkour battle. One that he was having with a much more experienced 
parkour master no less. This upset causes the master to see something special in our protagonist. He decides to take a chance on Evo by giving him a totem of undying, an item that can help him overcome the rigged parkour master challenge. He does this on the gamble that Evo could be the one to break the status quo and potentially save the whole of parkour civilization. Now, not only is Evo, as in the actor, not the character, good at actual Minecraft parkour with intimate knowledge of how it actually works, but his clear genuine passion for the activity is like lovingly translated into a story about class struggle. It just showcases that this was a labor of love with a lot of effort and thought put into it. For instance, the first pro we ever see in the series is right at the start. This guy in a gray shirt. This is the man who introduces us to the legendary raw beef or raw chicken dilemma, and he's technically the first face we see in the entire series, even before Eve Bo. The next time we see Mr. Gray Shirt is the first time that Eve Bo chooses to go for the raw beef. The gray hoodie man has this to say. No way! You made that jump? You might become a parkour pro one day. This one interaction will set up several parallels later on. We next see Mr. Gray when he's impressed by Eve Bo busting out his first ever on-screen 360, a move that becomes one of Eve Bo's signatures throughout the series. And next we see him as the warden that greets Eve Bo in prison after he died by failing the Temple of Parkour test. The next time we see this guy is at a checkpoint and he's requiring some sick kicks from Eve Bo again before he's allowing him to pass. He is again around for the second instance of one of Eve Bo's signature attacks. The backwards jump. Gray Shirt is so taken aback by this feat that he decides he has to try himself. And it's his hubris as a parkour pro that gets him killed. Now, uh, slight continuity hiccup here. I said almost airtight. It mostly tracks. This is like the only one I can think of, and that's because I was looking for it, tracking this dude's appearances across every episode. But basically, the last time we saw him, he died, fell into the void. And when you die as a pro, you're supposed to be downgraded a rank back down to new. But we see that same gray shirt dude come back as the parkour delivery man later. He's still wearing the pro rank iron boots, despite having fallen into the void trying to do a jump and fail it. We can excuse that though, because this is the part where the series has a really funny Easter egg of continuity. One that I appreciate more than I disapprove of the hiccup. You see, for Eve Bo's job next day, his task is a role reversal of what he's used to as a noob, where now he's the one who has to give the noobs the choice of raw chicken or raw beef for a harder jump. And when Eve Bo knocks on the door of his old stone mansion, who shows up other than Mr. Grayshirt, who is now a noob with a specific flashback plan? Mandatory parkour check. Aw, oh, great. It's you. You're a parkour noob now? Weren't you just at my house? Yeah, you delivered my parkour to me. So what happened? What do you think happened, genius? You just paid me a huge tip and I was so happy. And then I fell out the front door. The best part of this is, if you go back to the last episode where he leaves the house, he's not just making that up. Out of the corner of Eve Bo's point of view, right under his Minecraft hand, you can see the dude actually falling like he said he did in the episode after. That shit actually happened for real, captured in camera. Right after the flashback though, Gray Shirt makes the jump for the beef and he does land it, but it puts them back in a similar situation to when Eve Bo first made the jump successfully the last time Gray Shirt was offering him this choice. When Gray Shirt had the power he shat on Ebo and said he'd never be a pro. But with the roles reversed, Ebo is much more gracious. He tells Grayshirt that since he was able to rank up, then Grayshirt can probably do it as well. He really is trying to give him hope. Only for Mr. Gray to shoot him down and then fall down to the void and end up in parkour prison. And fittingly, Grayshirt's final appearance in the series is him in the prison when Ebo is on guard duty. He dies testing one of those super hard parkour courses. It's not just him that shows up in the prison though, it's also the old guy who helped Ebo get his ticket. The last time we heard anything about him, the old coot intentionally jumped into the void. Where would he naturally end up, according to the established rules of the world? That's right, in the prison. And he gets one of the funniest cutaways in the whole series to bring our attention back to him. All right, daily task completed. One step closer to becoming a parkour master. May you save us all, Evbo. And that is just two examples. This series is surprisingly good at keeping track of a lot of moving parts, both people and rules within the world. Despite being told almost entirely from Evebo's first person perspective, it does a near perfect job of keeping track of what several side characters are doing on their own time. Gray shirt guy kept falling down a layer. It lends to the feeling that people are still living in this world and doing stuff, even when we aren't seeing them. The rules of the world are simple. Parkour is culture and the center of life in every aspect. And every being in the world is bound by that same set of rules. The thing is though, it is canon that in universe, those rules can change. There's a through line of self-determination in there. It's a major motivator of the plot, if not the main one. It's so fucking cerebral, dude, oh my fucking God. And trust, there are no exceptions to these rigid rules. It's crazy how detail-oriented Evebo is at parts about every aspect of the world he creates. He makes sure it always ties back to parkour being paramount. There's not a single living being in parkour civilization that is not held to these standards. Even the resource 
course, animals have to do parkour. And in parkour civilization, even the animals had to do a parkour course. My daily task meant that I had to watch all of the animals that did the parkour course. Now I'm just gonna have to watch a cow fall off and die. Whoa, what the? Oh my god, this cow is cooking. How did he even do that? God damn, saying the cow is cooking is a crazy bar, considering that completion of the course decides who the animal is going to be eaten by. If it falls down, then the meat is unworthy of being consumed by pros and is left uncooked and given to the noobs, whereas if it completes the course, then it is considered worthy of being consumed by parkour pros. I cannot tell you the amount of times I was watching this and had to pause from laughing or screaming at the screen, just standing up in my chair going, oh, that is literally Snowpiercer starring Chris Evans and directed by Bong Joon-ho. I could go on about the elements of this thing I find legitimately compelling and respectable for a while yet, but I do want to step a little outside of the series itself and talk about the organic community that has formed around it. There are the obvious fandom memes which have taken on a life of their own, like picking the raw chicken or risking the one block vertical jump for the raw beef. There's alignment charts and tier lists of what your favorite characters from other series would choose and if they succeed at their choice. It's just generally funny to say, uh, we live in parkour civilization, especially when thinking about how much public space we have sacrificed to cars in our daily lives. You know, the risk of being hit by one makes a great comparison to the risk of death if you miss a single one block jump. People took note of how it felt like overnight we had become completely consumed in parkour civilization mania. I can only imagine what Eve Bo, the actual dude, is feeling right now. Nev compared it to how it felt like Dr. Han's look maxing over the good doctor memes took over the timeline in a similarly explosive way. And I think there is a good comparison there. But I think parkour civilization has a little more going on. Dr. Han was just an extension of the Chad compared to the Soy Jack memes that we were all already familiar with, but the parkour civilization jokes are about what actually happens in the series itself. It requires some deeper audience investment to fully enjoy. That deeper investment comes from, in part, its easier accessibility, or it's free on YouTube. It doesn't require a streaming service or money to watch it. It just made it more likely for people to check out the original material. And when they did, a lot of people found that, despite its kind of absurd presentation, there was actually some sauce here. It was fully acted and scripted, had surprisingly deep world building and battle mechanics, and you can like detect the thought that Evebo put into this universe he created, and the love and care just unironically comes through. The video is posted on a side channel called Evemo, which is a genius fucking name. I have had the best time making the parkour civilization story, and I actually don't think I've gotten so into a story before. First thing I built when I was coming up with an idea for a new series, I remember showing Siwa and other people just this little thing, and I was like, trust guys, this will be actually crazy. It is. It's so insane that this entire series pretty much started from this little sketch of the world. He took one little bit of inspiration, just a structure he built, and turned that into a fleshed out caste system. One that oppressed its citizens from the top down through propaganda and other means of passive and aggressive control. The video he posted is short, but it is an interesting watch if you wanted to pick the guy's brains, by the way. That detail I mentioned was one of my favorites earlier in the video, is actually one that I only really appreciated after finishing the entire series. The sequel to Parkour Civilization revolves around a rumor forgotten layer of parkour civilization. One that Evebo finds and travels to, but discovers that every person living in that forgotten realm wears chainmail boots. None of the standard show of rank that anybody else is wearing. It's something no one in normal parkour civilization has ever worn. And it's later revealed that Siwat, a major secondary antagonist of the first movie, was the last remaining survivor of this forgotten layer of parkour civilization. He was the only one who remembered it, and he sought to unlock the path back to the normal parkour civilization to destroy it as revenge against the old man who was your mentor from earlier because he erased it from memory, killing his parents. Slash back a little bit, in the original season, Evebo breaks into Seawatch's personal vault at the Parkour Bank. And what do we see inside this vault other than the only appearance of chainmail boots in Season 1, the known realms of Parkour Civilization, and who does it belong to other than Seawatch himself, the last remaining survivor? His backstory is coming from the Forgotten Lair was hinted at way ahead of time, we just had no idea to look for it. There are tons of examples like this, but that is just probably my favorite. I've already talked about a lot of the themes that are pretty interwoven within the story of parkour civilization, but there was a particular write-up on Twitter I thought was hilariously dramatic, but genuinely succinct in how it describes several of the lore elements. This original thread is by Twitter user Scarth, or at Alone with Memes. Good work on this, and you have made an incredible contribution. Parkour civilization can be best described as a meritocracy long past its prime, which has crystallized into rigid social caste due to a lack of checks and balances 
balances against the omnipotent parkour champion. Social mobility has been eliminated and exists only in propaganda. Class mobility is stifled by an inability for lower caste to practice parkour safely and consistently, making the temples of parkour functionally insurmountable for most. Even for the small few who excel enough to ascend the temple, impossible jumps are added as failsafes. Among the aristocratic parkour master class, symbolic displays of wealth and skill are required to maintain social prestige. Risky bucket clutches and lethal parkour battles are performed for honor's sake, with even the infrastructure being built around this cultural quirk. Each level of parkour civilization is trapped in some way due to their caste, whether it be by starvation and abuse for noobs, mandatory hard labor for pros, or dangerous ritualized bucket clutching and parkour battle duels for masters. Only the champion is truly free. When you write something that sounds believably academic to me, I can't help but feel smarter than I actually am after reading it. I have been glazing parkour civilization this whole video. I have no idea how many times I've said those two words in a row. It's barely words to me. But I want to be clear that I'm not blind to the fact that I'm being very dramatic for what is essentially the downstream product of the Yogg cast Shadows of Israfel. The fact that it has something to say about society won't make it a masterwork to all, and the absurdity of the concept, presentation, and packaging definitely helps carry its virality. But by that same token, when you look under how absurd all of it appears on the surface, the surprise is that there is something genuinely compelling. The four-hour session I took binging this last night wasn't just a hate watcher because I couldn't look away from a train wreck. Moments of the action and the storytelling actually kept me gripped. It stuck with me. And when you can create moments and things that actually stick with the viewer, that is when true, honest-to-God fans of something you made begin to emerge. It's not like we're strangers to Minecraft RP being dramatized through fan art, but narratively and in its messaging, I think this might be the strongest instance of something like that getting the fandom treatment. It has the fandom memes that spawn from anything with a healthy following, but the art itself is appropriately dramatized in their adaptations of it. Look at this goddamn digital painting of Evebo's final march to fight the champion on the Temple of Parkour. It captures the imagination of a generation. The visuals and design of the sets and the series itself are genuinely striking in a way that Minecraft builds seem to wow us with their ability to have time and time again, but here they're rendered beyond the confines of the blocks that make up its whole. There's real fandom discourse on who the best villain in the series was. This guy here posted a joke saying that the parkour champion of season one was the amalgamation of the most compelling elements of several iconic animaga villains, but the replies were unironically extolling the virtues of the second season's villain being infinitely better written and imposing as a threat, where the second season's antagonist was just genuinely good at parkour and didn't need cheats like barrier blocks when fighting Evebo one-on-one. -on -one. God, this shit has just genuinely consumed my life. I can't really get past that I'm still talking about it like that even though I know it is, but honestly, just give it a chance if you're interested. You might like it more than you thought. It has got so much more going on than the funny Minecraft movie with the raw chicken or raw beef meme going around. That card I mentioned to watch the full movie should be on screen now. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to drop a like and subscribe with notifications on to both me and Evmo. Evmo? I might have been saying his name wrong the whole time. I'm delirious right now, man. I'm on three hours of sleep. I'm genuinely excited to see what he does next, though. Anyways, this has been Quite, and I live in parkour civilization.